here. Today we're going to talk about the science of a grape milk bread with a focus on the Japanese milk bread made with yudane or tangchong, shokuba. Shoku is the kanji for food or eating. Pan is the Japanese word of Portuguese origin for bread. So shokubang is a Japanese neologism that literally means food bread. Since almost all recipes of shokubang incorporate a certain amount of milk as a given, we can think of it as a milk bread. But what makes it a Japanese milk bread? In shape, shokubang is identical to the long rectangular or square loaf of a regular white bread. Now, don't judge a bread by its appearance, shokubang is distinctively different from most Western white breads when it comes to the mouthfeel of the bread. Thanks to the incorporation of gelatinized starch, shokubang has a springy, mochi-like, and melt-in-your-mouth texture. As we bite into it, we can appreciate the natural sweetness and flavor coming out purely from the wheat flour. Shokubang's natural sweetness is different from that of sugar, which can be attributed to the fact that it contains a very high amount of natural maltose and dextrin. Here are the numbers for how much naturally sweeter breads with tangchong or yudane are when compared to those without. In this study for yudane 40, 23 milligrams more of maltose were found per gram of bread. While maltose isn't as sweet as sucrose, that's still a pretty large increase. Roughly calculating maltose as half as sweet as sugar is, 23 milligrams of natural maltose can be considered to be as sweet as 11.5 milligrams of sugar. So if the recipe uses about 10 grams of sugar per 200 grams of flour, 65% hydration, and makes a 350 gram bread, incorporating Udani 40 in such a bread recipe can bring about 40% more sweetness without any additional sugar. And what makes it particularly remarkable is that the bread actually gets sweeter over time. Adding to that, shokubang also retains its moisture content better, which is part of why it stays fresh and lasts longer. Judging by its global popularity, this bread seems to have won over many people, and you can count me as one, therefore this video. So now let's set out to explain the many things that make a great Japanese milk bread. First, I'm gonna walk you through the process of writing an ideal shokubang recipe. Of course, it's going to be based on science, and after that, I'm going to guide you through the process of making this great Japanese milk bread. Now, for the recipe, since we're going to be using these ingredients, let's quickly figure out how much of them to use. I write my recipes using a spreadsheet that enables me to adjust the numbers quickly, so what you see here are snapshots of my spreadsheet display. We're going to make a loaf bread with this standard Pullman pan. This column is for the weight of the ingredients, and next to it we have, respectively, the estimated and ideal baker's percentage. If you're using a baking pan of different dimensions or volumes, you can make use of the baker's percentage to scale up or down very easily. For this recipe, we use Udane 20. What this means is that we are using 20% of the total flour for our derivative ingredient, the Udane. The hydration level for optimal dough development for Udane 20 has been shown to be 71%. We're going to use this number as the upper limit of our dough's hydration. It's not like we can't go beyond that, but we want a soft but springy shokubang bread, so we're staying below this hydration. Now, to make a loaf bread using this Pullman pan, we need to have a dough that weighs around 540 to 600 grams. These numbers are the results of numerous experiments we did using this specific Pullman pan. The numbers translate to around 257 grams per liter to 286 grams per liter for normal and denser breads respectively. I've compared these numbers against the numbers recommended in The Taste of Bread by Raymond Calville, and the discrepancy can be attributed to the fact that Udani breads have a lower specific volume than those without. Assuming there isn't that much ingredient loss during the process, which is quite reasonable for this type of dough, the dough weight can be assumed to be the total weight of the ingredients. Taking into consideration that during baking there will be loss due to evaporation and other factors, in our case it's usually less than 10%, so as a result we expect the bread to come out weighing around 500 to 550 grams. With these guidelines in place, we can move on to figuring out the amounts of the other ingredients in the list. Let's start with the salt. Salt flavors the bread both by adding its own flavor and also by enhancing other ingredients in the bread. Salt is pretty fantastic, but only when used in the right amounts. Too much salt doesn't only interfere with the yeast and make bread too salty. A high salt diet can also have harmful effects on our health. And the fact that bread is an extremely popular staple food makes it even more important to reduce the amount of salt used in bread. 
Therefore, for this milk bread, we wanted it to contain no more than 1% of salt, as recommended by this paper published on the World Health Organization's official website. Government guidelines in the UK also advise that bread should contain salt at most at 1.01 gram per 100 grams, which in our recipe translates to about 5 grams based on the estimated bread weight. Now, as you might know, salt also affects gluten. It tightens and strengthens the dough. Too little salt can lead to a slack dough. Fortunately, though, following the guidelines for the amount of salt are still sufficient for making a good bread, since the percentage is as mentioned in this paper about salt. So, I quote from the paper, Adding salt to the flour markedly affected the physical characteristics of the dough, especially when 1.5% was used. Now, although the paper mentions 1.5% of salt, we need to make a small adjustment. Quoting another line from the paper, the effect of salt is thought to be primarily due to changes in gluten hydration, and hence there's a correlation to the protein content of the flour. The experiment in the paper was done using a commercial hard red winter wheat flour with a protein content of 11.31%, while we're using a bread flour with a 13% protein content, so we need to adjust it a bit. 13 divided by 11 multiplied by 1.5, that makes roughly 1.7, Baker's percentage of course, which is how much salt we're going to use. Now from here, we can actually immediately arrive at the total amount of flour that we're going to use. Since we know the amount of salt we want in the final bread, to make a shokuban with this specific Pullman pan, we need approximately 300 grams of bread flour. We set aside 60 grams or 20% for our gelatinized starch, tangchong or yudane, and our final dough takes care of the rest. To give you a heads up, in this video, I'm going to use the word tangchong and yudane interchangeably to refer to the gelatinized starch used in the recipe, and for this amount of gelatinized starch, I'll call it either tangchong 20 or yudane 20. Now, before we move on to the other ingredients on the list, we need to mention a bit about the effect of adding tangchang on the overall performance of the dough. We've discussed the subject extensively before, but most of our interest has been focused on the subject of starch gelatinization. This time, we're going to take a look at the effects of tangchang on the gluten proteins. A quick refresher on some basic biology. Proteins are molecules made of chains of repeating amino acids. The primary structure of a chain of amino acids is linear, but it can coil and fold to form a more complex and three-dimensional shape. In this form, it is technically said to be in its native conformation. And because native wheat proteins are ball-like in shape, they are called globular proteins. When a globular protein molecule is unfolded and stretched out, we say that it's denatured. This could happen due to changes in hydration, acidity, or in the case of tangchong, thermal treatment. When we mix water and flour, the molecules of gluten proteins unfold. This chain reaction enables our components to move around and build a transient gluten network. This network consists of many types of bonds, interactions, and entanglements. If the conformation of some of the gluten proteins is denatured by thermal treatments, like how it is in a tangchong or yudane dough, then their ability to take part in these processes is also changed, and therefore the dough formation process is greatly modified. The effects of different levels of denatured proteins and gelatinized starch on the dough have been extensively studied. From this paper, we learned that yudane bread has some issues with specific volume that mostly stem from the lower gas retention of the dough. It can't really retain the gas as well as a dough without yudane. The dough also requires a longer proofing time. Additionally, citing numerous references, the paper states that protein in the dough was denatured at 50 degrees Celsius, and the starch in the dough swelled and gelatinized at about 60 degrees Celsius. The paper points out that these temperatures were evidently lower than that observed during the preparation of yudane. In another paper on this, quoting Naito et al., it was mentioned that the gluten network of the yudane dough became significantly thick and rough compared to that of the normal method. To get better insights into the rheology of tangchong dough, we're going to use some information from this impressive and extensive research by Ke Yuen. From her dissertation, roughly translated, it says that since the gluten proteins in the flour used for tangchong have been denatured by thermal treatment, they cannot take part in the formation of gluten network of the dough. Therefore, as the proportion of flour for tangchong increases, the amount of gluten proteins that can contribute to the formation of the gluten network of the dough gradually decreases, and hence we get a weakened dough. 
Technically, this is supposed to be reflected in certain parameters of the Farina graph readouts, such as a shorter arrival time, doe development time, lower stability and valerie meter values, which respectively indicate the state of hydration, mixing time, tolerance to mixing, and the strength of the flower. But instead of the shorter times we expected, the results from our extensive experiments showed us that the arrival time of a Tangchong doe actually increases with the increase in the proportion of Tangchong. She speculated that it's due to the Tangchong having formed a colloidal state after the Chianization process. So when it's added to the dough, it takes longer to mix the Tangchong with the flour and water to form a dough. So the arrival time for the dough is longer. Technical facts aside, thanks to our extensive research, we can learn the Tangchong dough requires a longer mixing time to come together at first, and it also has a lower stability time, which means that it can't maintain its strength and viscosity for as long as the same dough without Tangchong. Another way to put this is that it has less tolerance to mixing. That's point number one. She also showed that the proofing time is longer for Tangchong dough, and she concluded that the proportion of flour used for Tangchong should not exceed 30%. Any additions of Tangchong higher than this level will cause the bread to suffer greatly in terms of the specific volume, and also bread height to width ratio. It won't be as fluffy. Some of this has been confirmed by other researchers in the papers that we mentioned before, but she provided additional information that for Tangchong percentages higher than 30%, the increase in the proportion of retrograded tangchung will actually accelerate staling, so definitely something to avoid. In this recipe, we're using Udane 20, and we do anticipate a decrease in the specific volume as demonstrated in the papers. But in exchange, we're getting a softer and naturally sweeter result, which will be even more wonderful when paired with the rest of our ingredients. So let's look at them next. We use a half a teaspoon of instant yeast to go with five grams of salt. Salt has a retarding effect on fermentation, so if we were to change the salt level, we'd have to change the yeast level to maintain the same rate of fermentation. There are many types of instant yeast, from standard to premium. To be clear, we're using the standard one. From our experience of regularly baking this type of milk bread using the straight dough method, we know that this amount of instant yeast and salt requires about 60 to 90 minutes of bulk fermentation and roughly 60 to 120 minutes of proofing at a room temperature of around 25 degrees Celsius to 29 degrees Celsius. Now, the amount of sugar 6% baker's percentage has been quoted in many publications. Coming from this paper on the effect of sucrose and water on the yeast gassing power, I quote, contrary to non-sugared dough, gas production in dough with 6% sucrose increased linearly according to flour water absorption. Another interesting finding from this paper is that gas produced after 3 hours at 38 degrees Celsius was constant in dough containing up to 6% sucrose. Also, yeast fermentative activity was much inhibited by osmotic pressure from excessive sucrose content, and to a lesser extent, lack of water in dough. It's important to note that the total gas production in dough with 6% sucrose was found to depend on the hydration in comparison to non-sugared dough. What it basically says is that since we're using sugar, we need a certain amount of hydration, enough water in the dough, otherwise the dough might not turn out as fluffy and airy. Well, you don't need to worry about it here since we've already accounted for that. We definitely have no issues with the hydration of the dough, so 6% sugar should be okay for this bread. Speaking of sweetness, we're also counting on the natural sweetness that the tangchong or yudane and the other ingredients are going to bring in. We expect that by using the minimal amount of added sugar, 6%, it will be mostly used up by the yeast. So we are left with predominantly natural sugars extracted from the starch of the flour. Quoting from this paper, sugared white bread has been shown to contain 6-7% to residual sugars. Half of it was maltose and the rest was fructose, and to a lesser extent, glucose. Okay, at this point, we know our bread will be plenty sweet and flavorful with enough sugar and salt. But what about the issue of the gluten structure of a tangchong or yudane bread? Let's add milk. We're going to limit the water replacement by milk to the amount of 25% based on the information provided by this paper. So that easily dictates the amount of milk to add here. As I've mentioned before in our previous video, besides the extra boost on fat and flavor, milk has been shown to increase water absorption, and it also gives the dough a better elastic response. This is, of course, beneficial to a dough with Tangchong 20. The milk has also been known to raise the dough's pH, 
but at this amount, we don't expect the milk to cause any issues when it comes to dough fermentation. Whole milk, like the one we use in this recipe, has an average of 3.5% fat. Fat modifies both the baking process and the characteristics of the bread, as mentioned in this reference. To produce an optimum texture effect, up to 5% fat can be used for white loaf bread, although more can be used for a softer result. The tenderizing effect of fat also slows down the staling process, which is an additional bonus for our chocobang bread. Bread volume also increases as the amount of fat increases, up to 5%, and after that it remains roughly constant. This has to do with the fact that a dough with fat can expand for a longer duration in the oven than a dough without. In this recipe, we go as high as around 6% of total fat, including the fat from the eggs, the butter, and the milk. This gives us a soft but still relatively strong loaf, which is exactly what we want. As our final ingredient, we add 50 grams of a whole egg. Eggs increase the dough strength and its stability, which is exactly the effect that we're looking for, since it pairs well with the tangjong. Eggs also contribute a small amount of fat to the bread, as we mentioned just now. So we have our shokubang recipe ready for the making. Now, this is an ideal recipe. It's based on numerous research papers, and as long as you follow the steps and adjust the timing to match your room temperature, you're probably going to get a delicious, fluffy, and strong loaf like this. That being said, in the end, taste and preferences are subjective. If you'd like to add more of a specific ingredient, or less for that matter, feel free to do so, although you should be prepared for the dough and resulting bread to vary by quite a bit. With that, let's get started with the recipe. Our first step is to make the tangjong. We have 60 grams of bread flour in a small bowl here, and then we're going to pour in 120 grams of boiling hot water into a medium-sized bowl before quickly tossing in the flour and mixing it all together with a wooden rolling pin, being careful with the heat, of course. You could also use a spatula if you'd like, but we find the rolling pin to be a little bit easier to work with. We'll cover this for now and let it cool down before putting it in the fridge to rest overnight. While resting it overnight is actually an optional step, this step will increase the tangchong's natural sweetness and improve the bread's flavor, so we highly recommend it. For more information on tangchong and its benefits, you can check out our previous video on it. Anyways, here's the tangchong after its night in the fridge. Now we can start making the bread dough. Beginning with a proper mise en place so that we can easily add all our ingredients in, we're going to first drop in the tangchong. Then pour in 50 grams of milk, 50 grams of a whole egg, 18 grams of sugar, 5 grams of salt, a half a teaspoon of instant yeast, and 240 grams of bread flour. Just tap it all in. On the side, we've also prepared 15 grams of butter to be added in after the dough has developed a little gluten. So we'll just let it soften for a bit. All right, let's give this mixture a good stir and then we're gonna put it into the stand mixer. Starting on a low speed, we'll let it run for just a few moments to let it combine and prevent the flour from flying. And then we'll take it up to medium high and let it mix for four minutes. At the end of it, we should have a dough that looks like this. And now we add in the butter. We'll turn the mixer back on and give that another five to six minutes to combine and fully develop. We're not using that much butter, so it should combine quite quickly. As explained before, tangjong dough requires a longer duration of mixing, but it has a lower tolerance to overmixing. So when the dough looks like this, as you can see, the bottom of the bowl is pretty clean. That means the dough is cohesive and strong enough to hold itself together. So we want to immediately switch off the stand mixer. Of course, we can do a quick window pane test just to make sure it's really done. Just stretching it thin enough and look at that, just beautiful. Now, because a well-developed tangjong dough has thicker gluten networks, you probably won't be able to stretch it as thin as you could with regular doughs. There's no need to spread it too thin, rest assured. With conditions like this, our gluten is well-developed. 
So now with some vegetable oil, we're gonna line a bowl and our hands. We wanna get the dough out of the stand mixer. Rounding it out a bit just in our hands. And then we wanna put it into the bowl and then we're gonna let it ferment. We've got a cool tip for seeing how it looks when it doubles in size. So you just use your scraper and push the dough up to the halfway line. That's what it should look like. So now that we know what it should look like, we're gonna cover it and we're gonna let it ferment for one hour or until it doubles in size. The timing may vary, so make sure to check up on it. Okay, when the dough's doubled in size, we'll continue to the next step. We'll start off by removing the cover and look at that jiggly dough. It's risen so beautifully. All right, now we're gonna flour our work surface, not too much. The dough hydration isn't very high, so it should be manageable with a minimum amount of flour. Then we're gonna give the dough a very satisfying punch down. Yes, it's very fun, and then we'll gather the dough up before placing it onto our prepared work surface. We wanna fold it in and round the dough into a neat bowl. We're gonna divide it into two equal pieces with the help of a scale, just using our scraper and a little flour if needed. This should be a pretty quick process, and once we've divided the dough, we're gonna pre-shape them into little round bowls. We don't need to do it too tightly because we're gonna roll it out after this. When we're done pre-shaping, we'll cover the dough and leave it for 10 minutes as a bench rest. Just give the gluten in it some time to relax so we can shape it easily in a bit. It might tear if we don't do this, so we're making sure to give the dough the time it needs. In the meantime, we're gonna prepare our loaf pan by lining it with some nonstick coating. We've got some pre-made here, but you could just use butter or some vegetable oil instead. Make sure to line every nook and cranny. We want a beautiful loaf with a smooth outer crust to come out not a patchy shakupa. All right, the dough's nice and relaxed. We can shape it now. Grab a rolling pin and one of our little dough balls, and we're gonna roll it out into a long rectangle. Using a little flour here and there if needed to control the sticking. We also wanna pull the edges, make them more rectangular. Doesn't have to be perfect, but it'll look a lot tidier if we do this. When it's about 35 centimeters long, we're gonna stop rolling and set it aside for a moment. We're gonna quickly just repeat what we just did for the other piece of dough. We wanna make sure that the two turn out looking roughly the same in length and width, so that when we roll them up, we get similar looking rolls. Using a small amount of flour here and there just to dust our hands, keep the dough from clinging. Then when they're both like this, we're gonna start rolling them up. Taking one, we're gonna fold in the sides like this. First folding one side to round the middle line before folding the other side over it, making sure the sides are neat and straight. We're also using the rolling pin to even it out. And after that, we wanna tightly roll that up, doing a little tug back after every roll or so. Just keep rolling all the way up. And then when we get to the end, we're gonna pinch to seal the seam. And we're done shaping this dough ball. You should have a nice and neat roll at the end. We'll put it down for now and get to rolling up the other piece of dough. So just the same thing. The key is really to straighten out the sides to get a neat roll. Of course, you don't need to worry too much about this since we're baking in a loaf pan. We're just making sure we get a nice video. Okay, now we have both rolls shaped, we want to put them into the loaf pan. 
but to get the maximum rise, we wanna arrange them so that they have opposite swirl patterns. So you can see how the swirl has a swirl that goes clockwise. We wanna adjust the other row so that swirl goes counterclockwise. Very easy, we just arrange them and then place the dough side by side in a single row along the lengthwise axis of the Pullman pattern. You may want to give them a small push to firmly push them into place and properly align them. And here my hand actually swiped the sides a bit, no problem. We'll just get some more of that non-stick coating on it and great. We'll now cover the pan and leave the dough for the final proof. We're waiting for them to fill the pan up to just below the rim, which should take around an hour and a half here. It may take longer for you due to temperature and dough variations, so make sure to check on the dough. And also remember the proofing time of a Tangchung dough can be a little bit longer than regular doughs, so keep an eye out for that. Before the dough is done proofing, make sure you allocate enough time for preheating the oven to 190 degrees Celsius. We're going to put it in immediately with the tray on the bottom rack at 190 degrees Celsius on top and bottom heat for 15 minutes before turning it to bottom heat and letting it bake for another 20 minutes. The timing and temperatures may vary for different ovens, so make sure to adjust accordingly to your own situation. This time, we're baking the dough with the loaf pan's lid closed, so we get a perfectly flat top, but you could bake it open. You just need to keep an eye on the top, and if you see it browning too fast, you could put some parchment on top and continue baking. With that, our shokubang is done. It looks gorgeous, smells amazing, and makes for wonderful sandwiches and toast. This bread, as mentioned, actually tastes sweeter the day after it was baked, but it was already amazing from the get-go. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching and bye!